next speaker is Martin Nauman. Um, I was just chatting to, to Martin a bit about himself, and he, he sort of says that his job is just to come up with and implement crazy ideas. So that sounds quite cool. Uh, and that he, does, he likes doing scary live demos. So hopefully this will be a good treat. Um, Martin contributes to Meteor.js. He also contributes to, to Firefox OS, and is one of the team behind Numbers, um, which is sort of in the banking JavaScript world. Um, and last night, he built his own slide deck software because he realized that if he's going to do a talk on web components, he should really be using some slide deck software that's built in web components. So we were checking earlier that was going to work, and, and hopefully, fingers crossed, it will. So uh, a big warm welcome to, to Martin Nauman. Hi, thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, Thanks for, whoops, uh, thanks for having me here in Barcelona. It's really, really nice to be here. It's really, really cool to see all these great people here doing great stuff, and especially the talks yesterday rocked it, today rocked it, and I hope I kind of give something uh, nice as well. By the way, Barcelona is really, really nice. If you have not been here before or if you're not from here, just walk around the city. This is actually a picture I took uh, while being on one of these touristy buses. So. What I do is, uh, as uh, I got introduced as well, I work for Numbus, which is the product of CentralAway. I'm the tech ambassador, so I'm talking to guys outside of the company, developers, uh, and as well as engineers inside our company. And uh, we work with, and I work with a ton of different technologies. There's Go, there's Ruby, there's JavaScript, uh, there's Java as well. We're doing banking, right? So we have to have some sort of Java contact, I guess. And um, I'm from Zurich. And some people yesterday, and even uh, someone on, on the speaker's dinner said, like, oh, Zurich is pretty boring, isn't it? And I'd just like to slightly sidestep here and say, no, actually, it's not as boring as you may think. So there's a couple of days ago, actually, uh, what they did as every year on the end of April to sort of say goodbye to winter, which, looking at the climate data from Switzerland, is very optimistic to do in April. Um, they basically built this huge snowman full of explosives, and set it on fire. So obviously, that thing blows up at some point. And the fun thing is, why are we doing this? Well, you know, first of all, afterwards, you can have great barbecues with uh, all the rest of the wood that actually lies around and is still pretty hot. Um, and sort of to say, like, goodbye summer, uh, goodbye winter, hi summer. And um, the, it's, uh, the legend says that the time it takes from setting it on fire, the, the snowman, which is called Berg, actually. Um, so the time it takes from setting it on fire to it actually blowing up will tell you if the warm, summer is going to get warm. And Switzerland wouldn't be Switzerland if we wouldn't actually analyze the data. <laughs> so um, here you see, here you can see the, the, uh, on the, on the y-axis, on, uh, on the vertical axis, you see the temperature, the average temperature. And on the x-axis, you see the uh, time it took to actually blow up. And you don't really see a correlation here. Someone on Twitter actually then took this picture and just drew a random line and went like, yeah, that's, that's exactly how it goes. Um, but still, it's fun, right? I mean, who else is blowing up a snowman just for the fun of it? Right, anyway, so actually, I'm here to talk about something completely different. So let's talk about it. Web components. So who of you ever has heard or actually, who of you has heard of web components before? And keep your hands up if you have used them. It's still pretty good. Um, so to understand what web components are for, you have to understand sort of how the web came to be and, and uh, how, it is, how it became so successful. So now while we are trying, or we developers are tending to, to go all in our wonderful world of programming and, and uh, try to express everything as, as programs, that's not what many other people do. So originally, the web came about to be sharing your research results, so you needed something that makes documents. And it turned out that actually it was pretty easy to build stuff. Like, this little girl built awesome stuff with awesome building blocks. And so HTML sort of came to be the awesome building block. At some point, you separated out uh, the presentation from, from just the content, and then that became CSS. And then you had some interactivity with JavaScript. So the problem is that. That wasn't really meant to be any sort of really super bonus uh, interactive thing. Though we have seen today that you can build awesome interactive applications, but applications are very different from, from being documents. 
So you came from these very, very simple forms, very, very simple building blocks, to super complicated, sophisticated UIs for applications. And not just the UIs, also just applications were built with this. Right? We, we could build a banking application, for example, or you could build a game or whatever with, with these building blocks today. But that became more and more complicated because we needed to sort of keep backwards compatibility with what is out there and um, the standardization so that you do not end up in a situation like uh, in 1999 or 2000 with IE. Um, the this, this standardization needs to be well thought out and actually well executed as well, which just takes some time. So the standard bodies couldn't really keep up with this, unluckily, and that ended up with stuff like that. So this is a filterable list of Chuck Norris jokes, and um, you could then go for, uh, I want that, or I want something where it kills something, all right, cool. Um, the problem with this is, so we, yes, we use the very, very simple basic building blocks to build such a thing. Um, the bad thing about this is that we are sort of mixing it in into the rest of the application, so it is not really encapsulated. It makes it really hard to compose it. This thing is, is horrific to maintain. It, it, imagine that something else has, uh, for some reason, something with an ID of filter term, and then it, this whole thing blows apart which is easy to spot in such a simple case. It is really, really hard to actually figure out what's going on if you have a really sophisticated application that is composed of lots of modules. And that's sort of the problem that many, many libraries and frameworks try to address. Um, there's, uh, there's, for example, Blade Runner that we heard about, which tries to do this thing with blades and components. And um, then there's Angular directives. And uh, a lot of others try to, to sort of do this encapsulation as well. So. That is where the hello. Uh -huh. That is where where you ask yourself when you build something like that, how do I move on? Now you could just leave it like that or package it up as a jQuery plugin and just hope that it never ever blows up anywhere and you get blamed for it, which is not really the best attitude to this sort of stuff because it's your code and you're sort of responsible for it as well. Um, you can try to directly go into the browsers and sort of do the native implementation and sort of hide it away from your user by encapsulating it, by making it an actual component or actually part of, of the browser. But then again, there's tons of browsers and there's probably pretty much more fragmentation to come maybe with mobile devices. Mm. So that's a hard, hard thing to do as well. And maybe you're not that much into C++ or Objective-C for, for uh, anything else. Um, so not really a way to go. So that, that leaves you with uh, actually making sure that you're talking to the standards bodies and making sure that it becomes a standard. And um, that, is, that is a very idealistic goal, nonetheless. Standards bodies have to take account, into account what is out there. And it's a, it's a democratic thing that's going on. And so there's lots of hard discussions and lots of reasons not to do something, though it is awesome to do. And it just takes a really, really long time. I want to give a shout out to the W3C guys. They're doing a really, really good job at that. And they're really, really working hard on this stuff. And I don't want to be in this discussion. And I actually, as a web developer, I have to move on, right? So I built this component. And then I'm like, yes. And now I want to, at some point, reuse this thing or actually give it out to the world so others can use it as well. I don't want to, I don't know, spend two hours a day in some sort of IRC channel where I get shouted at um, for not having seen something. And that's where web components sort of come into play. So the idea is, instead of having us muddle through with all of these technologies on very, very shaky grounds, uh, it is creating a set of standards that is there to just give us a proper method of encapsulation and, um, and reuse and composability of all the things that we just created. And they should, to the user, and that goes back into this building blocks idea of, of HTML. To the user, it should just feel like it was part of HTML forever. I don't want to do any, any jQuery stuff where I have to go like, oh, yeah, and then you need that library and that dependency over here. Or you just use Bower to install all these magical dependencies that are over there. And then you have to have this CSS. And then you need the theme uh, to make it pretty or this and that. It's really complicated for, for a user who's not really into programming. Imagine a designer just going like, I just want to demo to my boss some, some concept, and I just want to drag a component somewhere or 
write a component, declare a component somewhere, and then just have it work. So this is where these standards come in. So web components, whenever someone says web components, think of these four things. There's the fifth one, which is not really spec'd out yet, which is decorators, but um, ignore it for the moment. Practically, these four cover your bases. So, um, and I'm going to go into details with some examples for each of these four, and you're going to see how they play together really, really well to build um, composable things, which also takes some pressure off the standards bodies, because then we can just pretend to have it, actually have it sort of in the language already or in our toolbox, and then they can go, actually, that thing 95% of the people use, and that thing is a low-hanging fruit, so let's just standardize this thing and actually deliver it uh, in a proper way. So what you do is you use the building blocks you have, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, to build new elements and new components that you can then just plug together and have it working. Whatever your component is depends on you. It could start with a filterable list like I did. It could go on with, uh, it could go on with a photo booth app that you just plug in into a complex application like, I don't know, Spotify or Facebook, where everything could be a component. Like, imagine Spotify has, a, has the playlist, and that's a component that is actually built into another component that is the thing that you see. And then inside there, there's more components. So this is how the slide deck is done, by the way. This is, this is one huge component that's a slide deck that takes care of moving slides back and forth and styling slides generally. And then each slide is one component that takes care of displaying itself properly. And then you see these, um, these live demos are another component <laughs> that allow me to load a file, display it on the left-hand side, and actually run it on the right-hand side and updating it and all this kind of stuff. So let's start with the template element. That one has been around pretty long and is actually pretty well supported in browsers nowadays, except for Internet Explorer, unfortunately. But you kind of expect that today. Um, by the way, I'm trying to sort of balance future and today uh, with the counters. So uh, at the end, I'm going to ask, how am I doing? And I'm going to try to balance it out again. Anyway, um, so yeah, we have this wonderful template element. And what is up here is basically a piece of document that is not active yet. It is inert. It just sits there and waits to be called or copied or moved or actually called into action. So this script in there does not get executed unless I actually put it somewhere, somehow. And then I have this button, and I can um, click on it, and then it will ask me for a headline. Hello, future Jess. Today is a wonderful whoops, day. Today should never pass away. Very poetic. And here we have our wonderful um, headline. Now, what does this give me? Well, it allows me to actually prepare my template somewhere and some, somehow. Uh, I could load this asynchronously from a script or something uh, instead of actually having it there. So it, it sort of makes templating a little easier. And when, 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 you, when you actually want to insert it, it's pretty easy. You just query it, use the content of it, and then just clone it somewhere or move it somewhere. I could have moved it as well. And that's about it. It's very simple, actually. And um, so that is that. But then I have this problem that it sort of leaks. So what I mean with that, with that is let's modify this a tiny little bit. You're going to see me modifying demos today quite a, a lot because it's sort of a live coding thing. And I wonder if I can, can I move these? Do I get shouted at? Here, no shouting, that is great. OK, that's, that's a German method. In Switzerland, I would never, ever do that because I got probably, I don't know, jailed for it or something. Um, Swiss people are super defensive, but really, really nice folks. You should visit Switzerland. Anyway, um, uh, so what I could do is I could do an alert that does document dot query selector or So I get all the headlines that are in the document, and I count them, and I tell me if it happens, and I say, today is so nice. And then it says one, and obviously if I, if I do this a second time, future JS, it's second, it's two words, so future counts. Um, and then it's two. So it still leaks, sorta. Imagine this not have, just having a tag, this having an 
ID or a class selector or anything or style sheet attached, that would mean that I now actually leaked something that should not be in, outside of my little world into the, op, uh, into the document using it, and that's bad. And that, bloop, that was fun. Um, and that is where the shadow DOM comes in. So it's sort of the same code. It has a little adjustment, which is, first of all, I'm too lazy to type that stuff in, so I have a test for headlines thing that says fountain zero headlines. Woo! Um, and I have this button at again, and this time what I do is I uh, create a new div, just a div element, no, no fuzz about this one, and then I create a shadow root on this div. Now, what does that mean? Well, who of you has actually seen how Shadow DOM works already? In that case, I'm going to explain it. Um, great for those who actually have. Awesome. Um, so what it does is it says, basically, I, I cut it out here and whatever. I create a new node in the DOM, but it's disconnected. So I, I put stuff below this node. I add child. It's, it's a subtree as well, as the rest of the DOM is the tree. But it, the position in the tree, so this, from, from the top perspective, if I'm the browser, I sort of go in. But if I'm the application that lives somewhere here in the tree, I could query the tree, and I would go shadow root, and then I just go on somewhere else. I will never, ever go into the shadow root. I can. I shouldn't. Um, so and that's what happens here. So I create a new node in this DOM tree, and it is a shadow root. And then I add my content from the template into this shadow root. And then I append the container just as I would anyways uh, onto the document. So that works still pretty well. Is this the future of live coding? Today, we'll find out. OK, now I click on this test for headlines, and it still says zero headlines. So it did not leak, but it is there, right? So there is a headline, but it says, like, oh, the, no. Is there something broken in my code? Let just, uh, let's just try that. I could say I'm now appending directly to the container, so I basically make the step um, useless, but it doesn't matter. Whoop, whoop. And I click on the test for headlines. And now it found the headline. So this thing sort of does what it is supposed to do, right? And it even works on IDs as well. So I could say ID magic. And um, I can then modify this to say uh, I want everything that has this magic, um, this magic ID. And then I go, hola. And click the button. By the way, hola is basically 80% of my Spanish knowledge, so. I try to use that as much as possible so I get the best out of it. Again, Swiss thing, I guess. Get the best for your money. Um, so it, now it found this hot line. And uh, if I now go back into the Shadow DOM thing, see, si, es bueno. And that, that is 100% of my Spanish. Um, and I click on this, and it goes zero headlines, isolation. Wonderful. So that, I keep doing this. Um, so that is pretty good. So now we have the shadow DOM, but it's still a little quirky to use because we have to deal with this uh, still with the JavaScript bit, and we can still make mistakes, and it can still be really, really nasty, and it's not, not really declarative, and it does not really solve the problem of people just wanting to drop elements somewhere like they would be in, in native HTML. In native HTML, you don't have to do anything like document dot create element. No, no, no. You can just put the tag in where you want it, and you're done. We want that as well for our wonderful new components. So what I do here is I um, introduce the uh, custom elements, which is the third of the four standards. And uh, as well as the Shadow DOM, the Shadow DOM just landed um, in Firefox, I think it's in stable now. I'm not sure about that. Um, but it's prefixed, probably. And in Chrome Beta, it is without prefix. And I think Chrome did a sort of Hail Mary maneuver there. It was like, oh, yeah, by the way, we just write you to let you know that we're actually shipping it without the prefix. And everyone goes like, whoa, whoa, what? So yeah, it's out there now. Um, but it's hidden behind the flag, as far as I'm aware. So you need, if you want this to run, 
you have to enable some flags and you have to sadly run Chrome. It, it's not possible to do this in the other browsers yet, but there's polyfills. And so uh, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, exactly, custom elements. So this code here allows us to finally say, I give you some sort of declarative way as well as an imperative way um, to, to sort of use these components like you would a native HTML element in your document. So what we do is we use, um, I could be more specific here, but I just say I, I use the prototype of uh, the HTML element so that I have all these funky um, properties that I need. And then I create a new object from that, which is my new prototype for my new element. Then it has lifecycle callbacks. The created callback happens when the browser loads your element, because that can happen asynchronously. So that means that it's not already there uh, if you're unlucky. And this tells you, all right, I'm ready. I can actually now process you and make you happen somewhere in the DOM and make you appear and work. So get yourself prepared. So this is sort of the initialization on the global level for the component, not for a certain instance of your component. And um, what I do in here is I create the shadow DOM, and I put the content in, and uh, that's it. And then you go on with the attached callback, which happens whenever the parser, because the parser then goes again through the DOM and goes like, that's one of these components. And then this callback is actually called when, the, when it's inserted into the DOM, right before it's inserted into the DOM. <laughs> so what I do here is I then ask for the message that I should display for this particular instance so that I can have the messages per instance rather than again, globally. And then we just register it. It happens down here. So we say our tag should be called x-headline. That you see that X pretty often is just random because people are lazy to type stuff, but you could say, like, uh, I could say numbers dash account list or something, uh, or you could say whatever you feel like. Important is that it has to have a dash because the dash makes it easier for the browser to figure out, all right, this is actually not a normal component, so the dash is mandatory by the spec. And that, that then uh, registers it with the browser for, for use in the documents, and it, I give it just the... the um, where is it? The prototype that I created over here so that it knows how it should behave. And I make it available on the document so that I then can just say, I'm creating a new X headline. That's the imperative way. And uh, then there's a test again. So I can do this now. And it doesn't work. That's great. It's probably because I ran this beforehand. And uh, the problem is that if it's already registered and it tries to register again, then it throws a syntax error. So this demo is not really suited for this particular use case, but well, that's, that's what you get. We my own element in HTML. How futuristic? Does that count? Now it counts. It's two words. All right. Yay, there we go. And um, I can obviously, and now I'm going to run into this problem again that the element is already registered, so I rename this into headline yay. Really bad naming, but doesn't matter. And I put it in here just to show you that you can do it um, declarative as well. Headline yay slash x headline yay, not making a syntax error here. And then it directly asks me for the message, because now it got attached. And I say, OK, right. And it's there. And I can still then create headlines. Headlines. And I can still do this, and it still says there's no headline here. So it's still isolated, everything working fine. So now we finally got ourselves into a position where we sort of have an isolated working uh, declarative and imperative um, component. But if you look at the code, it's still like, that is not really user-friendly. Imagine that you have to ship that around. OK, you could put it in a JavaScript file, and then they have to figure it out. But I don't want that. I want to make it semantically more useful or actually more expressive. Because putting it in a JavaScript doesn't really tell you what's going on and why the JavaScript is there. So they got us covered there as well which is HTML imports. And HTML imports are just nothing else than another type of link that you can set. So you have this, this link type for style sheets, and now you have a link type for uh, imports. 
which happens over here. So this is the, basically the whole thing that I, I wrote beforehand is adapted now to the filter list, which ignores no uh, jokes, and it's put in this separate file. So I can now just import it like I would import a style sheet as well. It's just more, I, I feel it's more semantically uh, useful bec or expressive because it's actually a link to something that I want to import to use. I would prefer to be called like link relation component, but you, you, know, you know, you just don't get to vote everywhere. Um, so yeah, and then you have just the filter list and you have the, the, the list and items just as you would with a normal list. And uh, I could do fancy stuff here as well. I could, uh, I could show something uh, when it comes to Shadow DOM, which is what you can do in Shadow DOM is you can specify, actually no, I make it here. Um, best naming convention ever. I just make these things up. So because the, another question that I often get asked is, how do you get this in, declar in a declarative way? Because right now, the content in this one comes from sort of imperative magic, and that doesn't have to be. I can, I can do this, content slash content, which takes whatever is in here. Um, the future is nice. So is the weather today. Um, and I, I can declare this thing somewhere down here. I lose the lines. And I can make sure that it doesn't try to ask me something to overwrite this thing. So that now the attached prototype sort of is useless. Um, I go in here. And then it just takes it from here. And what is really nice with this is that you can say, uh, I want to select a certain thing. And this is just a, a CSS selector. So I can say primary. Um, and then I want a secondary headline as well, and I can say, well, I'm, I'm just a little lazy today. Um, and I make this a headline JJ3, and I can now go in here and say, I want to have this param, or make a diff just for funs and giggles, uh, class equals primary. Is bueno. And then I have some sort of other content that doesn't really matter. Div ABC. And just to show off my awesome Latin skills, I can do div lorem ipsum. Dolorum set amum or something. Um, I modify this thing down here. And I run the demo again. And as you can see, it now selected the thing that I said is primary for the H1 element. And the whole rest goes in whatever, and the least specified uh, uh, select a content element ever. And I only have a second one. So it just goes like, oh, this one I pick for my H1 element for my headline. And then the rest are just stuck next to it, into the H2 element. So that's possible as well. And uh, I hope it didn't break the demo to actually go there as well. So, this all being nice and fine, one of the things that I said when I saw the web components stuff for the first time, I said, that's really cool stuff. It's just very sad that we can't use it. And it's pretty ironic, actually. If you think about that, this, this stuff is there to help us get away from the problem of, oh, yeah, this is really cool stuff, but we can't use it because my browser doesn't support it yet. And we can't use that to fix this problem because the browsers don't support it. So sort of ironic, really. But, I have pretty good news, which is, first of all, this is really, really active. It's sort of bleeding edge. I woke up this morning just to check if I'm still up to date, uh, only to find out that I'm not. So yeah, that's fun. I, I really, really hope that my, uh, my, my MacBook wouldn't crash, because then maybe Chrome would update automatically when it restarts, and then all my demos would stop working. That would be nice. Um, but I was lucky it didn't crash, or Chrome didn't update, and I'm not sure what, which one. Uh, happened really, I can't remember. So web components are sort of in your browser already. So this is what happens when you actually inspect. There's a setting in the Google Chrome developer tools that says uh, show shadow DOM and inspect user agent shadow DOM. And if you check those and you click on the video element, that's what you see. So even the Chrome guys couldn't really be bothered to actually use native stuff. They just used the, the different um, 
diffs and, and uh, an input here and an input there. And you can do that with pretty much everything. An, an input is not a native input anymore. It is actually a diff that has content editable uh, set to true. So the browsers are sort of dog fooding on this, which is pretty handy. Um, and that sort of blew my mind. Because, I mean, who of you expected that actually these elements are not native elements, but just a random collection of web stuff? Who did so? Hands up. You're going to get probably something. Smack in the head or so. I don't know. Um, so yeah, that, that sort of blew my mind. Nonetheless, the browser support just isn't quite there yet. As you can see, the, the IE guys are a little behind. And some of the things that are yellow, I would consider not really yellow, but dark orange, but OK. Um, that's, that's very optimistic. But that's the compatibility matrix. And uh, the good thing is that there's some, some polyfill from the Google guys and some framework to help you not deal with the problems that I just deal with, uh, which is these standards are in flux. So they are still not, not finalized. They're evolving. They're actually in, under rapid and active development. And so the stuff changes, right? So that is why I wouldn't use that in production but I, I don't know why I came up with this idea yesterday evening. It's like, oh, let's, let's completely redo my slides as web components, um, which worked out, which is surprising, but it's cool. Um, so th these two frameworks sort of abstract away the nasty bits and pieces and the hairy wiring that you have to do so that you have a more or less consistent interface to work with stuff. And uh, Polymer, the, the, you could use whatever you feel like. You could either use the whole framework, which is contrived of a set of um, it's, it's the polyfills. It is elements that they build for you, so you don't have to build them again, like a style rating widget and things. Um, you can actually use them with vanilla um, web components as well, so they're interoperable. That is pretty cool. Um, and then there's uh, the, just the platform thing, so you could use whatever layer you want. And uh, with x it's pretty much the same. They use the same polyfill. They just apparently couldn't be bothered to write another polyfill. And why? I mean, it works. And um, so that supports down to IE 10 or now no, actually it supports IE 9 plus uh, all the mobile browsers. If someone here is doing phone gap applications, it also works on phone gap on Android 2. Point something. Polymer doesn't. The polyfill does. Fine. And then if you just want to give it a try, uh, I highly recommend the Mozilla App Maker. It's really really cool. You can drag and drop stuff. My uh, my now four-year-old uh, nephew played around with it and built a sort of a mobile app that you have a button, you press the button, and then it fires fireworks. Very impressive. Um, so yeah, there's a collection. Brick and custom elements.io are a collection of um, web components ready to use. Brick is more in the direction of X tags, so they are trying to get tied in there, while custom elements is more bound to work with the polymer. So most of the elements there require some sort of polymer stuff. And uh, yeah, that was my talk. You find the slides online already. As I say, you need a Chrome browser that actually supports um, the flags. You have to set the experimental uh, web platform stuff. And, um, but the talk will be recorded anyways, right? And then uh, you find me on Twitter. I'm Geekonaut with uh, three instead of E's. And um, yeah, thanks for having me here. Thanks for listening. I hope it was entertaining and useful. Thanks a lot. Hello. Hi. So I imagine if you like to have a nice uh, component-based architecture, you would like to nest components into another component. And can you do that with Shadow DOM and other solutions? The presentation was all about that. The presentation literally is built as a slide deck component, which nests slide components, which then may have a demo component. You could use each of these components uh, standalone or you could nest them. So basically, all the demos that you saw were actually nested within three layers of components. And it just works. OK, thanks. You're welcome. What's the coolest thing that you've actually seen in production using this stuff, using polyfills or whatever? Sorry? What's the best thing you've seen in production using this? I haven't seen something in Have production you seen it? yet. What's the most exciting thing you've created with it? Um, the most exciting, for me personally, the most ex my laptop has gone, OK. Um, the most exciting thing I have done is that, or I didn't do it. That's the, what's exciting about my okay. nephew. Literally, I'm not, I'm not making this stuff up. My nephew, five years old, 
dragged and dropped stuff with the app maker onto a canvas that was sort of um, trying to be a phone. And then he said, look, I click this button, and it makes fireworks. And the, the coolest thing is you then click on publish, and then you install it on your phone. Right. Who, can, who can do this stuff with five years? And it's just because it's so freaking easy. It is Lego for the web. That is cool, yeah. I think. Cool. Awesome. Thank you very much, Martin. You're welcome. Thank you.